when all women are supposed to welcome all people. And think about this. The woman also is the one who gives to her baby. Oh, look at that baby. Whoa. Okay. Sorry, the baby kind of got colored by my nieces and nephews. Uh, so, I've never seen this before where one of my nephews would take a baby doll and try to nurse the baby doll. But many of my nieces, when they had, um, old, when they had younger siblings, they saw their mamas doing that. And they knew that they were feminine. Now, and, and so there's something about the female body that lets us know that we're supposed to welcome and also care for. And do you know that even the way God made our arms, a guy's arms with their rough and tough and buff body, they're meant to go boom like that to protect and serve, although remember, not all the time. And then we women... Our arms are made where we can hug people better. This is a physiological, biological fact. And you know what? The church in Rome, that is St. Peter's, the reason why they designed those colonnades, those columns on the side like that, was to show us that the church, which is seen as feminine, is there to welcome all people. And so you and um, you girls... And guys, think about this. You girls, you and I are supposed to be welcoming and we're supposed to care for others at all times. So think about examples in your life, ladies. Like, for instance, what happens when, like, you're supposed to get into groups and there's one person who doesn't get picked to be in a certain group or whatever. To be a feminine um, person would be to say, hey, come on in our group. It's like welcoming like that. Or we are good, aren't we, when someone is um, very sad. We know how to share our shoulder and let him or her cry on our shoulder. In all sorts of other ways, we're very good at being sensitive and to listening to others and caring for them. That is a gift. So we are supposed to welcome and to care for. So let me summarize this um, a whole segment by reminding you that a guy... You, you guys are rough, tough, and buff, and you're supposed to protect and provide. And ladies, we are hiding and inviting. And that means we are supposed to welcome and to care for. And I'd like to end with one more story. Um, and to let you know that um, I've talked with many um, teenagers who have fallen in the area of sexuality and it's very sad because the guy, instead of protecting and providing for her purity, instead does the opposite. And I'm telling you, the um, former students I've had and others that I've talked to, the girls who share that with me, they feel so used. They know that they have not been protected and provided for. And um, ladies... We're supposed to be hiding and inviting, and the more and more we're like that, the more and more we'll be happy, and we can raise that standard for guys because they really do, they really do want to um, love us properly. And remember, the opposite of things like this, especially in the area of um, sexuality, is pornography. Especially you guys. I know many guys who have been unfortunately dragged into that and they don't want to be but they've gotten help they've told their parents they've t confessed it to the priests and they know that that pornography is all about using and degrading women it totally goes against protecting and providing and you girls who might fall into the tendency of showing oneself um, whether by cell phones or, or other things that goes against being mysterious and hiding. So you can live out the language of the body. You guys could be rough, tough, and buff to protect and provide, and you girls could be hiding and inviting. One last story. My friends Zach and Aaron, this is a really hard story as well. They're good Aggies, they're married, um, but before they were married, Aaron went to me for spiritual direction, and she said to me, Monica, I'm thinking, of dating Zach. 
And normally I would think that was great because Zach was a daily mass goer, said the rosary, he loved God, was so giving, was a great professor at, the uni- at Texas A&M University. But I hesitated. Why? Because I knew that he had a disease called cystic fibrosis, which meant if they got married, then Aaron within years would be a widow. But she discerned that she should do that. Sure enough, they dated, got engaged, and got married. And yes, um, as that disease happens, um, it, it struck. Even though he had a transplant here in Dallas at St. Paul's Hospital, he was on his deathbed. I remember going there. I, I tried to go there almost every day to be with Aaron and Zach. And I remember being very struck by the fact that though Zach's rough and tough and buff body was failing, he was very fragile. He lived out the language of his body by providing leadership for us. He would take his hand and he would turn his hand over and that would be his leadership in telling us that we were supposed to pray. I'll never forget that. That even on his deathbed, Zach was letting us know that we should stay faithful to God. He was providing for his wife Erin and for me and others in the room. And I still remember this, that we didn't think he would make it to Aaron and Zach's anniversary. But sure enough, I think he must have asked God to let him stay alive because on June 20th, the, exactly a year after Fernando died, I was there, it was like one in the morning. We knew he was about to die. And I got to see Aaron kiss him one last time as he drew his last breath. That was a very moving experience. And both of them together showed me what true love is about, the gift of self. Not using each other, but loving each other throughout and living life to the full. So you young people, I know you want to have hope and you want to live lives of holiness. So please live according to Pope John Paul's Theology of the Body. All right, I have one more um, section. So I'm going to come back in just a second and we will finish up with the Theology of the Body by Pope John Paul II. I'll be right back.